Welcome everybody to this Edge of Mind podcast where my guests today are true luminaries and I am beyond excited to share the opportunity to talk to Daniel Goldman and Sonia Rinpoche um, for an hour or more. So I wanted to read a, a biography of both of these remarkable individuals and then jump in to discuss a, a really wonderful book that they have just penned that I have to say when I read it, I could hardly put it down. It was so well written and so informative. So I can't wait to share my enthusiasm around this. But Sonia Rinpoche is one of the most renowned teachers of Tibetan Buddhism trained outside of Tibet. Deeply versed in both the practical and philosophical disciplines of Tibetan Buddhism, he is beloved by students around the world for his accessible style, his generous and self-deprecating humor, and his deeply personal compassion and insight into human nature. The father of two daughters, Rinpoche nevertheless manages to balance family life with a demanding schedule of teaching around the world and overseeing two nunneries in Nepal, one of the largest nunneries in Tibet, and more than 50 practice centers and hermitages in the eastern region of Tibet. And I have to say a little, um, I'm not sure if disclaimer is the right word, but I consider Rinpoche one of my teachers, and so it's a great honor to spend this time with him. Daniel Goleman is a psychologist, a science journalist. He was with the New York Times for 12 years. He is best known for his really remarkable book, Emotional Intelligence, which will be published with a new introduction this fall for its 25th anniversary. Daniel is co-founder of the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Its mission centers on bringing evidence-based programs and emotional literacy to schools worldwide. With Richie Davidson, Goldman wrote Altered Traits, Science Reveals How Meditation Changes Your Body, Mind, and Brain, Review of the Best Studies of Meditation. And his most recent book, the one we're going to be talking about, is Why We Meditate. And so again, deep bow gratitude to both of you. And I wanted to just say to our listeners a little bit about um, some of the things that really struck me about this book before I, I sent some questions your way. And one was just the, the, the genius of the structuring of the book, that is a wonderful demonstration of this East-West um, gentle bridging that's taking place, the cross-pollination of the ancient wisdom of the East and the modern knowledge of the West. And the way the book is structured is Rinpoche does a really wonderful teaching at the beginning of each chapter. And then Dan comes in and does this amazing kind of um, scientific backing and, and Western approach, um, kind of elaborating on what Rinpoche is talking about. And so not only did I very much appreciate the bridging between um, East and West, even though with globalization, those parameters are changing, but I also really deeply appreciated the way this book um, integrated the, the, the dance between didactic material, the teachings, and then a, a, a host of very skillful practices, meditations to embody, to incorporate the teachings, um, which is a, a, of incredible importance because if we can't bring these teachings, of course, into our bodies and really live them, you know, what fundamental value are they? But I wanted to start by um, sending this question to either one of you. There's so much in this book and I want to have, uh, I'll, I'll ping some very specific questions for some areas that I really want to unfold with you. But because there's so much in here, maybe we can start at the outset about what your aspirations are. Um, what do you want readers to walk away with after having uh, worked with this book? Because there's just so much rich material there. So perhaps we could start with that. Let me jump in uh, and um, give you um, kind of zoom out to the background of how the book even happened. Uh, I was at a retreat with Che at uh, the Carrison Institute, and he asked me to give a talk. I had just finished the book, Altered Traits, looking at all of the hard evidence on how good meditation is for you. And it turns out to be very, very good, ultimately. There's a dose-response relationship. The more you do it, the better it gets. And remember, Che said, would you give a talk to uh, you know the people at the retreat, which I did. And then after that, he said, you know, my students in Asia would be really interested in this hmm. because of the scientific base, because there's a strange phenomenon where new generations of Asian students look to the West for affirmation, for, for what's true, what's real, so to speak. And uh, so the science has particular weight there. So we decided to book 
with that in mind, and this is the book that uh, we ended up with. So it integrates, as you said, Andrew, um, uh, Rinpoche's uh, approach and his methods, which are very powerful, I think. And then I would look at the Western science, or I should say science, not necessarily Western, and see, you know, uh, how, how do the two fit together? They're yeah. beautifully turned out. Fantastic. And Rinpoche, I'm curious, from your end, what do you hope your readers will take away from this book? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, my hope is to find or uh, connect with the basic well-being or okayness uh, I call essence love. Uh, just the beautiful of the heat of the love was not really discipline or not uh, based on object, just the source of the love or sometimes we can call um, inner joy, uh, basic well-being, and somehow we lost that connection in the uh, modern world because of so many things happening and we value our love or happiness or joy with external things, mm. which is fine for me. It should be that way. But time to time, come back to the source mm. of your own well-being, which is I call unconditional happiness or mm. joy or love, love or okayness. So <laughs> there's a lot of names I put together. So the main thing is uh, love. So and then on the way to connect to that basic well-being, we might meet some obstacles. Mm -hmm. I call uh, leftover imprints. Mm -hmm. uh, some are, all the imprints are not healthy, many healthy, many not healthy. So if you can uh, transform those unhealthy, I call distorted uh, uh imprints which quite often activated and then we experience that and this distorted unhealthy um imprints we start to believe it mm. so that there's a way that you can try to uh desolidify it with the uh, identification of yourself so there's some few mantras like i made it up more or less with uh, based on Buddhist teaching, the I call is like a beautiful monsters. Mm. Mm. But if you transformed that, it can be very beautiful. The beautiful you that you understand your state. It is very beautiful. You understand other people's uh, suffering and understanding. So if you don't transform that, it could be uh, difficult to yourself to others. So. There's a way I develop handshake practice. Mm. Uh, the cognitive mind and feeling based body with the emotion, basic well being, somehow meet together and not to disturb. Uh, and the beautiful monster eventually starts to open by itself. And then there's a communication so that I say it is real but not true. Uh, the leftover residue of distorted uh, imprints feels very real, but it carries a wrong messages. Mm. So I say it is real, but not true. So it's called, I call communication with the beautiful monster. Then you open up. When you open up, then is I call open heart. You're not rigid or not affected by the a beautiful monster. In fact, you can be a friend of that. You can be a good friend. And then you become very healthy. And then you can connect with the essence of love. And eventually, essence of love start to express mm. a very healthy love. Otherwise, as of essence of love is like a hollow inside of you. Mm. You might have so many things, you might have so many friends, but deep down, you will feel lonely and hollow and alone. So this is uh, my one of my hope to find that well being. 
and then transform the uh, beautiful monster, then the essence love starts to shine into the loving kindness practice and compassion practice. And with love and loving kindness and compassion, then you can connect to the larger world. And then I think there's a small contribution that you can make as some kind of world peace through individual. Well, Rinpoche, I, I didn't think it was possible, but I think you just elegantly summarized the essence of the entire book. Um, really beautiful. There's so much to unpack here. But I, I do want to say, um, I want to ask you this question, Rinpoche, because again, the, um, amazingly rich material. This notion of essence love, which, um, as you know, Trungpa Rinpoche used, his languaging was basic goodness. Mm. It, it runs against the grain of the Western enculturation, the Judeo-Abrahamic traditions, the, the notion of original sin. Um, and maybe, Daniel, you can say something about, I know your dear friend Richie Davidson has actually done some studies that, that tend to suggest the veracity of this proclamation of basic goodness with children. Maybe you can speak to that. But Rinpoche, I'm wondering, have, have, you, uh, has, have these teachings been received warmly in the Western world, um, in your experience, or are you finding a real resistance and rub to the somewhat radical proclamation that, well, well, what do you mean? You mean, are you saying that deep within my heart, I'm basically okay? Are you, are you really saying that deep within I'm, I'm maybe even divine? Um, I'm curious how, how this has played out in your teaching experience. Are people receptive to it? Are they relieved? when they hear these teachings or are you finding some resistance to it? And then maybe Daniel, if you could run a little commentary on that, sure. um, you know, that would be really rich. I think in deep down, uh, they received very well. Hmm. And I think we human beings are longing for that because that essence love is a birthright, I call, hmm. is a, our innate, one of our innate nature. Mm -hmm. And you can see the young children, they quite often carry that. Mm. They are kind of joyful without any other reason. And I call that is a spark. Mm. We possess that, we carry that. But the, due to the conditions, fast faced world, objective, uh, you know, uh, get something from outside. And uh, of course, that is also wonderful. I'm not denying that. We need that. I think my point is we need both the inner one and the external one. Mm -hmm. I sometimes I call happy without reason mm -hmm. and happy with the reason. Mm -hmm. But if we keep whole our life with the happy with the reason, and that making ourselves more vulnerable and hollow and lonely. So okay. Sorry, yeah, go then. Ahead. No, go ahead, Rinpoche. This is great. Okay, I thought you were doing you're saying something. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll say after you're done. Thank you. <laughs> so but uh they they value it and they like it, but the, when coming towards to that, there's some challenging. Uh because I you know, drop the uh rigid uh overthinking and then aware of your awareness awareness aware of your body and then come back to your natural feeling and in that feeling time uneasy there uh, because of many people carry different imprints so it might come in close to the imprint at the beginning a little bit uneasy but if they practice again, again, then eventually the beautiful monster start to relax mm. and no need to afraid of it. And then when it start to transform, oh, they enjoy very much. <laughs> and they're looking forward to have uh, more beautiful monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Andrew, let me pick up on your earlier point. Please. Um, Richard Davidson, the neuroscientist at the University of Wisconsin, with whom I wrote Altered Traits, has a program to actually an app 
to facilitate the sense of well-being from a completely different angle, very complementary to what Rinpoche is talking about. But his research on children is very important. Mm -hmm. He's found, he started a, a program for pre-K and kindergartners, uh, the kindness program. Think mm -hmm. about this. When your kids come home from school, do you ask them, how did you do on the test? Or who was kind to you today? Those are two very different lenses on the mm -hmm. day the child had. And unfortunately, uh, as Rinpoche points out, uh, in the West, particularly, children experience a kind of conditional love. If you do well, then I love you. It's not who were you, who were you kind to, it's did you get a 97 on the test? Mm -hmm. And that shapes us in many, many ways, one of which is to develop over a lifetime kind of driven that Rinpoche talks about, a sense of, you know, ambition that can never be met. Uh, you're just going on the treadmill. And, and um, the beautiful monster idea, I, uh, Rinpoche acknowledges nicely in his book, uh, in part came from a converse, conversations with my wife, Tara Bennett Goldman, mm -hmm. who integrated mm -hmm. mindfulness and uh, a kind of psychodynamic cognitive therapy uh, to look at the emotional patterns that don't serve us, that start in childhood and bring us through life. And uh, the approach that Rinpoche has taken, which I, I think Rinpoche, it, it does come from Tibetan practice, your, your approach to beautiful monster, but it turns to be supported heavily by good reason Stanford on the power of acceptance mm -hmm. of not away patterns and your anxieties and your troubles, but being with them, accepting them. Uh, and as, as Rinpoche shows in the book, this has real, real power in terms of getting beyond them to get to this deep sense of well-being. So one thing, um, I would love to hear both of your responses to this because I think the following is an important question. On one level, what Rinpoche is, is professing is the essential nature of the human spirit, that fundamentally this really is what we're made of. Um, and so I'm wondering how you balance or reconcile the two vectors of um, psychological and spiritual development, because in the book repeatedly, and I think very um, authentically, you talk about the importance of training and, and, and practice and, uh, you know, just more traditional um, approaches to spiritual path. But on another level, the, the whole notion of essence love seems to um, invite the alternative approach of discovery. And so I'm wondering how you work with those. On one level, yes, we need to practice. Um, the more you do this, like any other venture, the better you get at it. But on another level, this also seems to imply a more absolute irreducible instruction, which is just open and relax. And mm -hmm. then the inherent qualities naturally flower. So I'm mm -hmm. curious um, for both of you, maybe starting with Rinpoche, yeah. How do you balance, how do you work with those two vectors, those two, you could say, paths? Yeah, the whole thing is to coming back in the sense of uh, reconnecting. It's not that we are building or making the essence love. More or less, our attention, our focus is when out and trying to get something from outside and instead of love or well-being or happy. So now, of course, you can that, but change a little focus. And the way you come back is the path. Where you're connecting to the essence of love is the practice. It's not that you are creating new thing in you because the essence of love is the Birth right is coming from your birth, but we are disconnected from that. So where you're coming back, there's a way. Start from dropping, being, meeting, communication, and then hello, the essence love is shining. Yeah. It's not that you are making the essence love, it is there. So now you are we have a more available and connecting with that essence love and make sure we have that connection whenever we need. In fact, we should have all the time. And with that, and that is 
opposite of hollow. Mm. And then you can have whatever you do, it becomes very healthy, not sub uh, center cherishing only. Mm -hmm. Because you're okay here. And you don't need to eat all the plastic to make, <laughs> to fill that hollow. Yeah. Yeah. And then that could be good for environment also. <laughs> Many things. Uh, you don't need to like, a, you know, sometimes I call that hollow is hungry ghost. Mm. Eating all the plastics. Mm. So you feel okay. You feel okay within the, not okay. The main point is the life has ups and downs. Mm -hmm. but within that, you have some source that you can be and then you have ability to deal with your difficulties problems sufferings whatever there is a strength mm. and then is not that whole path of dealing will not become a, a self-centered mm -hmm. uh, cherishing in fact it will shine more love and compassion to the others and to the situation you know, I just want to say one thing, put it to put an exclamation mark on one thing you said, Rinpoche, before I, I turn it in, um, over to Dan. And that is, you know, very often people look at, at these spiritual principles and they think, oh, what do they have to do with the real world kind of thing? But I think if people really grasp the type of, this is my languaging, the type of spiritual reductionism in the best sense, that what these teachings do is they really drive the complexity of the modern life into very simple fundamental spiritual principles. And one that you touched on that is so critical is that if we continue to maintain this sense of lack or, or deficient emptiness, then what, what are the statistics, Daniel? The average American consumes like 200 times the world's average of natural resources. And so this very simple principle has colossal implications to what we're doing to the planet, to what mm. we're doing bringing about global warming, the ecological crisis. So it's just a way to, to reinstate that these, these teachings have vast applicability, immediacy and profundity um, to everything that's happening in the world today. But Daniel, I'd be curious to see um, what you're, how do you like to run with this? What are the two? The two oh, well, um, you know what occurred to me listening to Rinpoche is the importance of understanding um, the negative results of what his late student John Wellwood called spiritual mm. bypass. Oh, of course, beautiful. Where yeah. you use practice to avoid facing these realities. Uh, you know, you can get into a nice blissful state, but hey, what are you doing to the planet? What are you doing to your family? What are you doing to yourself? You don't see it. And so, uh, and, and that's the reason I appreciate so much Rinpoche is doing, because he's helping us to look directly mm -hmm. at what we're doing in all those domains to ourselves, uh, you know, the people around us, to the planet itself, uh, because we don't want to see it. And, and he helps us see it and go beyond it. Beautiful. And Rinpoche, be before we move to um, a topic I really want to explore with you, if you don't mind, could you, could you give us a little specific example about, I, I really love the, the notion, even the image of a beautiful monster, it, it's, a, it's a classic, um, wonderful way to bring in two seemingly contradictory phenomena together. Perhaps can you give us an example of how to do this? Let, let's take, for instance, anger. Um, there's so much anger in the world today. Mm -hmm. How can we use this very common beautiful monster that many of us are experiencing now, especially with the upcoming midterms, mm -hmm. How, how can, if somebody came to you, in fact, that'd be me. I'm coming to you saying, Remish I have a real problem with anger. I don't see a lot of beauty in my anger. I just see the monster. So can you talk to us a little bit um, about how to actually um, implement like handshake practice in relationship to anger to transform mm -hmm. the monster into something beautiful? Yeah. Uh, of course, we have to have always uh, backup of a cognitive uh, clarity and understanding. Mm -hmm. and But anger is not only in the cognitive mind. It has a, a physical implement and is connected with your beautiful monster also. So I think we 
understand the whole thing. And then anger is a special energy. And uh, if we can use that energy in the right direction, it can be very useful. And then we can solve problems with that strength. Mm. But if we don't see it, and with that anger, there is a nasty uh, hatred and the blocks all our clarity. And it's just make everything very dark, but full of energy. Mm. So how do you know? Maybe you know in a cognitive, but you still react like that from the feeling. Mm -hmm. So the way is, mm -hmm. I asked, drop the, the reactive, reactive thinking mm -hmm. and come back to the body. Mm -hmm. You see the elements in the body mm -hmm. and then relax that little bit and more relax with the handshake practice and then you will see there is in the emotion and then that emotion is connected with uh, the beautiful monster of anger and then you stay with that or stay nearby it's just i call meeting being is kindness mm. and listen the energy of the anger not react stay mm. close if you stay very close cannot react. Mm -hmm. I have a very uh, funny example. The boxers, when they do on the stage, mm -hmm. after fourth, fifth round, and one will hug others. Right. Is there love? Is they loving each other? I don't know. But because becoming too close, you cannot react. Mm -hmm. If you stay a little far away, then you can punch each other. But you come very close. So the mind and awareness and come back to the body and stay with the anger itself. And that intensity of the anger are slowly reduced. And then you invite the strength of the anger with the wisdom of the mind. And then you can solve the problem. It's the anger will not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. The strength will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. The anger will cloud your mind. That's right. So the and issue that anger, in that anger, there's few things are there: hatred, yes. and the body element, emotional element, cognitive wrong thinking. So all lump up one thing, then mm -hmm. it clouds mm -hmm. our mind and the feeling. So. How do we know? We don't know at the beginning. So give some time. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes very clear. Because a Buddhist, we believe everything is impermanent. Mm -hmm. It will not last forever. But you have to be a little patient. If you can stay with the anger, it's the best. If you cannot stay anger, stay nearby. Mm -hmm. Don't stay in the next room. Mm -hmm. Stay in the one room mm -hmm. and relax, the mind relax. Feeling relaxed, anger is still the beautiful monster is still like a banging on you. <laughs> you don't bang this way. Normally, anger come you 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 follow. I call it indulging, or you suppress, or you ignore, or you're trying to put a method, trying to transform change. You keep hitting, fighting. That will not help. It will boost more. So relaxation is important. Awareness and relaxation, be together, then everything becomes very clear. Then you use whatever you need to use in a positive way, with the essence of love, mm. then you can change the world mm. without cloudy mind mm. and uptight heart. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So Danny, yeah, run with that a little bit. Um, you, you, you talk really be uh, beautifully, and I can't remember, I can't centrifuge every one of these statements who said what, but it may, it may have been you, um, the, the critical importance of relationship, that there's fundamentally nothing problematic with the arising of the energy to which we append the label anger. What Rinpoche is actually talking about that maybe you can run with a little bit is, is a, a process of deconstruction, taking apart the narratives that, that impose and really pollute this basically pure energy. That's the beauty in the monster. 
So the issue is really, isn't it not, is um, relationships. So talk to us a little bit about that. Before I talk about a relationship, let me talk about anger. Right. About the difference between useful anger and useless anger, mm -hmm. which is really important to understand. Remember the Dalai Lama saying, uh, like Rinpoche is saying, anger is energy. And to make it effective, you need to put aside the hatred. Mm. And this speaks to relationships. You, you need to see that them is us. But he said, keep the energy of the anger. Mm. Keep the focus of the anger. Keep the persistence that anger gives you and work toward a useful goal. The useless mm -hmm. anger leads you to do things that you regret later. Mm -hmm. Useful anger is one that can be skillful. Mm. And so, uh, it, for example, relationships are what our world is made of, right? you know, our personal world. And we want to preserve and enrich our relationships. We don't want to destroy them. Anger invariably harms a relationship, the useless anger. Mm -hmm. Useful anger, people may come on board with you. So yeah. I think that the two really are related. If you understand that we need our relationships and that anger is uh, something that actually can mend them rather than destroy them, mm -hmm. that's powerful. Beautiful. Rinpoche, the, 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 one of the most beautiful parts of the book, and I'd have to say for me, the, the most impactful chapter was the last chapter. I just devoured that material. Can you talk to us a little bit about, because I thought it was it was so skillful, to talk to us a little bit about the four I's. Now, for our listeners, this is not E-Y-E. -E, this is the four I's, letter I is in me, because there's so much confusion in the spiritual business about this notion of selflessness, egolessness. And, and your articulation um, of the four types of I I found extremely insightful, impactful, and very, very helpful. So talk to us a little bit about that, because part of what we're kind of circumambulating here is, again, this is my languaging, there is no original sin in Buddhism, of course, but if there was, in my opinion, it would be reification. And so when, when I heard you talking about reification and, and the first of the four eyes, the reified eye, I, I was 100% behind you. So talk to us a little bit about the four eyes, why they're so helpful and how to engage these principles. In general, I is very important, is a source of identification. Uh, no I, no source of identity to express. So, but it has to have a healthy, I. So the first I, I call mere I, M, M E R E, is the healthy one, the functional I. Because we have a body and all the skandhas, a Buddhist point of view, and we have the external phenomena and the perceptions. So they, with that, there's something is called I is that I is really need to be like a solid, like a rock uh, or like a tightness. No, it's just very functional, healthy, me and mind. And Buddhist we call mere I. Mm -hmm. And that has to have that. Even Buddha would say, I will come tomorrow to your place please you come to my place. So there's a sense of I in the healthy relative truth mm -hmm. that we are not denying. Mm -hmm. But the problem is there is independent almost, mm -hmm. singular, independent, permanent self, like a based on near I, and we make very tight, like a, I call reify I, everything is like a solid. There's no room for impermanence to take place. There's no room for fluidity. There's no room for dance. There's no room for acceptance. It's just like a grasp on me and mine. And that is the source of suffering because it is not in the reality. 
The reality is the healthy eye. We should land on that. We should respect that. And then, because everything becomes so serious, so tight, and there's no room for expression, no room for art, no room for beauty, everything has become dark and then tight and then black, sort of like. Even you get angry, you tight up like anger as like a rock. Or you maybe sometimes you experience love, but you hold on love as a permanent thing. But the love can change, anger can change. So wisdom with the changing is not allowed because of reification eye. And that is the sometimes we call we don't believe original sin, mm -hmm. but this is temporarily mistaken element coming out of this reify eye. So because of the impermanent teaching, because of emptiness teaching, because of space, openness, we're trying to open up that reification mm -hmm. and the land into the healthy eye. But many people make mistake when we say emptiness, no eye or no ego, actually is focusing on the reify eye, not the mere eye. Mm -hmm. But people make mistaken, they like to destroy the mere eye also. Then you lost the point, you lost the reference of relative truth. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a relative truth. Mm -hmm. And then the thing is like when you are really uptight, you lost uh, joy, mm -hmm. you lost love, everything becomes like a still like an iron in you. And everything becomes very serious unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. And then it creates some thing missing inside of you because you squeeze all the natural well-being with the reification. Mm -hmm. Then you start to have a second, third eye is called self-centered cherishing eye. Mm -hmm. Because you don't feel okay. And I want to feel okay. What shall I do? Oh, get more things. Do more things. And that, because of that tightness, it creates hollow insight. Mm -hmm. And in order to fulfill that hollow, we get something from, mm -hmm. from wrong, wrong thing. So there is a way I call desolidified eyes, desolidified egos. So it's not a one like that. So open up. Then you see, oh, reification, less. Act, respect, mere eye. Within the mere eye, and then you see, oh, there's some self cherishing. Me, 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 I call it like a, all about me. Mm -hmm. Of course, me need to be there with the mere eye. Is healthy, but not too much. Everything me, me first, I that, I want, I, I happy, I, my, you need to love me, you need to care me, uh, I eat the first one, I eat the best one, this is love. <laughs> Why? Because you, you feel like that, mm -hmm. because there's a hollow. Mm -hmm. So I said, handshake those mm -hmm. area and they reconnect with the essence of love. Then you can shine to the world. But on the way to that, small things are not making you happy anymore. Mm -hmm. Like a food doesn't make sense because you will have food, a relationship, eh, ups and down, not fulfilling your hollow. And now you want some big things. And then it's, oh, you are Rinpoche. Then I, I give you this joke, like when you smile, on the street, some people say, oh, you have a so good smiling. And then at the beginning, you don't believe. And not only one person, five, six people are saying the same thing. And eventually, you start to believe. I am a, I am a smiler, smiling person. I am the smiling Rinpoche. I am a smiling Rinpoche. Because that is projected by the others. Mm -hmm. And you start to believe that as your identity. Social eye. Social eye. And that's called social eye. There could be a doctor, there could be a, anything, you know, a professor, teacher, 
anything slowly, you hold that as as your own is me. And that is not me. It of course is part of me, but who you are real is this mere eye with the essence of love and with the insight as a simple, beautiful human being. And this social eye is sometimes very helpful. Maybe it's like a so we should use with the essence of love and connect with the social eye, express as a compassionate social eye to help others. Like His Holiness using this perfectly. He always is he's a simple Buddha, but he has a Dalai Lama social eye. And he used that social eye not for him to cling and satisfy it, but he know he don't need that because he is a simple Buddhist monk with with his practice, with his true nature, with his essence love. But he used that platform to help other, but he don't live with that social eye. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. So Danny, let's let's riff on this a little bit further because. Oh my goodness, does this have practical uh, applications today with the pathology, the shadow side of social media um, and the incredible pressures of identity structure based on the sure. feedback that people get using that um, platform. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that and, 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 and some other science that supports this view. Well, uh, you know, from a scientific point of view, we know that social media pushes young people particularly distort social eye, you know. Some will, will spend a long time getting ready to go on their TikTok or whatever, so they look good. They want to project this self, which has little or nothing to do with who we are, but they identify with it more and more. And we know from data that the, the longer someone spends doing this, doom scrolling is one term sometimes used, the more yeah. depressed they get, the more hollow they feel. Exactly what Rinpoche is saying. Hmm. Uh, one thing like social eye is very I call very high maintenance. High maintenance, yeah. It's not, it's not you. It's people project on you, and you take on, and you start to believe it's me. Mm. It's a misunderstanding. Yeah. And if you live with that, oh, it's a lot of suffering. Yeah. But it is very useful if you use properly, especially with the platform of compassion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and along these lines, Rinpoche, uh, and, and actually Danny as well, there's, there's often um, in, the, in the spiritual communities, this categorical dismissive um, approach to any sense of self. And what you're talking about with the importance of the, of the mirror eye, which my, my teacher, Kempo Tsuchum Gyamsa Rinpoche, talked about dependently arisen mere appearance. Mm -hmm. The notion of mere doesn't merely apply to me, it applies to reality to other um yeah. everything can have this kind of healthy dismissiveness that is just mere appearance but but talk just a little bit further about the importance of having a baseline healthy self-sense um jack angler right danny what did he say you have to be somebody before you can be nobody famously you so need an ego before you can give it up exactly so maybe talk to us Rinpoche, a little bit more about the importance of a, of a healthy eye that again, the, the, the relative sense of I is not an issue, the relationship is. In fact, if we engage that properly, that creates a healthy platform for us to then engage in spiritual practice. So maybe, so because people often categorically say, oh, I just have to get, I have to get rid of my ego. Well, it's like getting rid of age two, right? You, you transcend, but include age two. So can you say a little bit more about that? And, and, and Danny, if you want to run with that a little bit too, because I, I think this is important for people who just categorically think, oh, I just need to annihilate my ego when it's just a particular developmental way of looking at the world, right? I think you have to uh, understand and separate this few types of identification. Mm -hmm. I. Mm -hmm. So everything you put under one umbrella mm -hmm. and the one thing and you get it of that, that is not right. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of get it right, get, get off, instead of like a, get it off, mm -hmm. I would say uh, desolidify it first mm -hmm. and then 
minimized uh, misunderstanding of the rear fire eye and the too much self centered cherishing. And then you should, we should land on the, the relative eye because uh, my, I have a body, I have a perception. They are right now exist, but where they exist, a Buddhist point of view is a mere exist mm -hmm. because if you look into it, it's not there. Mm -hmm. But it, but is it, it is there. So the dance between nothingness mm -hmm. and thing has a relationship with interdependence. Mm -hmm. We call emptiness and appearance, mm -hmm. and the, we we cannot uh, miss both we have to have in order to understand the fullness of reality we have to experience the appearance mm -hmm. and its essence as a one unification mm -hmm. then is healthy not a neglation or nihilist or the essence is not really something is there that does not mean appearance is also reject mm -hmm. Emptiness or openness is together with the appearance. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, you know, two truths uh, and emptiness, appearance, uh, like a uh, inseparable. I think we are looking either the appearance side mm -hmm. or emptiness side, and then it's become uh, 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 you know problematic. Mm -hmm. So the truth. If you want to know truth, the appearance is one thing and is natural emptiness is one thing, but you cannot separate these two, two, two things. If you experience unification way, then is you know whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so no, anyway, anyway our, our, the ground of spiritual practice or our life it need to be healthy relative and with a mere eye yeah. and connect with essence love. Yeah. And Danny, as a psychologist, you, do you see, um, can you talk a little bit about the pathologies when that isn't related to properly? Some of the things that you've seen um, both in the literature and also in, in perhaps in, in clinical work or in real world situations? Well, I would look to Mental science and what are called lines of development, mm -hmm. which mean uh, you know our body develops in one line, our ego, which Rinpoche has been talking about, in another line, uh, spiritual life, and still another line, and hopefully they all come together. Uh, and I think that the pathology, which is so common and so widespread, that you know, there's a very thick book called the Diagnostic. And the manual of psychiatry, which lists like hundreds of psychiatric disorders, which are all ways in which this can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, you know, they're too numerous to list, but each of us has something. It's, it's just what happens to you growing up in modern culture. Uh, we, get, uh, we get a distorted way of thinking about things, of feeling about things. And those distortions become habit patterns that drive us through life. Uh, and uh, all of the pathologies, for example, there's a whole set of pathologies that have to do with much anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's a set of pathologies that have to do with, uh, physiologically, these may be overlapping, they may be different, but we trigger them ourselves very often by the way we think about the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the thinking is modeled in exactly the same way Rinpoche is talking about, in that we think something that will help us actually hurts us. Yeah. We, we look to, you know, people who have the same pattern of uh, uh, having uh, lovers who uh, that all end disastrously in the same way. Mm -hmm. That's a hint. That's a clue that we've got one of these patterns. And so... Uh, there are many ways to clean it up. And I, I really respect Rinpoche saying there's a place for therapy too, mm -hmm. uh, because you may need therapy 
uh, in order to uh, you know get your ego together in the best way so you right. can give it up in the best way and by the way giving it up and here andrew i really appreciate what you're saying doesn't mean denying it doesn't mean right. killing it it means keeping the good part and leaving the part that is screwing you up exactly and, and ribiche as, as we start to close up because i know you have some time commitments what, what Danny just pinged on here, I think, is so um, critically important in the West, and you're one of the rare Tibetan lamas that actually embraces this view that, I mean, this is my languaging, the, the, the challenge I often get when I um, even broach the topic of integral approaches to spiritual development, that um, why not engage the skill sets from the West? And, and I sometimes say, what, what my languaging, you know, this notion of like Buddhism Buddhism doesn't need therapy in, in double double meaning intended, right? Buddhism is 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 complete in, in and of itself. But I think one of the things that really attracts me to your work, Rinpoche, is um, your acknowledgement of the skill sets of, of the West, the psychological disciplines, the methods that are engaged, that sometimes, yes, I think perhaps on an absolute level, the teachings on emptiness, for example, so-called theoretically, they can handle anything. But practically, they don't seem to work that way. And, and I, I share this from direct experience. And then I'll pause to let you talk about this is I will often go to a, a program where I've been, I gave a presentation maybe 10, 20 years ago. And the person will come up to me complaining about precisely, exactly the same psychological issue they had 20 years ago, where their teacher, their meditation instructor said, oh, you, your meditation, you need to meditate harder there's something wrong with your meditation. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, what your embrace of, of the Western skill sets, working with psychological approaches, how that's enhanced your own understanding, not only of the Western mind as you work with Western students, but perhaps even more directly, has it had some impact on you personally? Has it brought insight into your own workings of your own mind and heart? Definitely. Uh, at the beginning, like uh, 30 years, you know, I, I came to, to, to the West and <laughs> I didn't know about uh, so much about the, uh, you know, culture. Mm -hmm. And I give a lot of teaching uh, based on cognitive uh, mind mm -hmm. and uh, focusing on meditation and uh, uh, relative truth and ultimate truth kind of unification teaching. Then eventually, you know, it's, it's, when I give teaching, it's working very well. It's fantastic. But over the years, uh, some area is not transforming. Mm. Understanding intellectual, mm. and that is great. And then meditation also become like a, a technique or it become like antidote towards to the some other stuff, especially to the feeling world. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite right something. And sometimes I use also meditation as an antidote towards to the, you know, something you don't feel great. Uh, and if I hold on the meditation and meditation should take care of all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's not working sometimes my, in my, myself and my students. So I was exploring yeah, and then, then I met, uh, of course, Dennis, uh, and also especially Tara mm -hmm. uh, Goldman, and we talk, share more things. Then also I met uh, John Burgwood, mm -hmm. uh, oh. and uh, you know, uh, then I learned so much uh, beauty from the uh, modern psychologist uh, world, uh, explain very clearly. Uh, sometimes more clear than Buddhist uh, uh, approach, especially then I sort of know oh, all of that very much connected in the feeling world. Uh, then, of course, in the Mahamudra teaching, Dzogchen teaching, there is a, a principle of handshake. Mm -hmm. But that handshake is more like a basic relative to uh, we call uh, afflictions, mm -hmm. uh, anger, attachment, jealousy, proud, ignorance, some kind of. 
but that works quite well. But at the same time, there's some which you call distorted relative truth, not healthy relative truth, which is I call a learn habitual imprint from this life. Mm -hmm. And in that imprint, some are healthy, some are not healthy. And Buddhists, we don't talk much about this unhealthy imprint, how to transform. More or less like healthy imprint together with the unhealthy sort of, and then go beyond, uh, 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 wake up from the samsara. Mm -hmm. So, which is a great thing also. So that I put a little emphasis, help of my, you know, friends. And then uh, I, I develop a beautiful monster, means the learn habitual pattern from this life. The healthy one, I'm not calling beautiful monster. The distorted relative and unhealthy, and it disturbs you and other. And then that bring in your practice, together with that, and I do myself every day also. And then there's a, you know, a lot of things, I think we don't need to mention all of that, like top 10 beautiful monsters, <laughs> top 20 beautiful monsters, right. I think we all know. So somehow we're aware of that, feel that, stay with that, be kind to it. Listen is kindness, not rejecting is kindness, not suppressing is kindness, and uh, lean towards two. Leaning is also kindness. So then one day the beautiful monster start to trust to the, our cognitive mind and then they're ready to get the knowledge from the mind and through the another special feeling and that feeling communicate with the beautiful monster's feeling and then transform happens in our heart, mm. in our feeling world. So then also like, a, you know, I discover when I come to the West, the speediness, mm. the distorted speed, yeah. I call uh, lung, lung. Yep. And yeah. if we don't take care of that, then I think that will uh, destroy our joy, or the, the emotional, uh, subtle body, I call restless feeling, is banging on our mind, banging on our physical, and even you do 10 minutes of work, but you feel so, so tired. Mm. So the three kinds of speed limit, the body speed limit, mm. and the cognitive speed limit, and the subtle body, restlessness. So there's a way that you are aware of that, handshake with that, and then the find right balance of speed that can serve our life. And no need to have an extra suffering. Yeah. The basic suffering is good enough. It's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say, Rinpoche, amazing. This is a, a fantastic summary. And for listeners, um, like I said at the outset, I can't recommend this book um, highly enough. And there's a couple of things that Rinpoche did um, kind of see that he unpacks in great length in the book. The, the wonderful elegance of the handshake practice, which I think is just genius, is really explored in the book. The notion of the three speed limits, the working with the breath, extraordinarily skillful. And so I highly recommend my listeners to um, purchase this particular tome because it has a, a, a wonderful east-west um, mm -hmm. cross-pollination, like I said at the outset, also the integration of the, of the teachings with the practices. And so Rinpoche, I know you're in the middle of two big retreats. Is there any final words, um, either based on this book or just generally that you would like to share with my listeners um, based on the atmosphere of what we've talked about um, this morning together. Any final words before yeah. you return to your program? <laughs> kind to your beautiful monster. <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Juju Jay Rinpoche, big bow of gratitude on behalf of my community. And Danny, if you want to stick around and we can have a little. Sure. A little bit. Um, but I know Rinpoche, you're so busy. I'm so honored to have spent this time with you. All the best to you in, in your retreat. And I very much look forward to a wide success with this amazing book. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me here.